If you want to use a chainsaw, you should take it by the handle. You should not take it by the blade. And if you buy a microwave, you should not use it to dry your cat. And by the way, if you want to use a washing machine, please do not put any person in the washer. All things that are useful can be used in the wrong, in the wrong way. Even in ways the people who invented the tools had never imagined. But it can be damaging, both for the user and the environment. Most of you work for central planning agencies. And such an agency is, exists for policy, for politicians and policymakers to support them and to actually develop useful tools. Tools, mostly in the forms of models, that can provide useful insights in very complex problems. But they are tools that can sometimes predict what the effect is of different policies. But tools, just like other tools, can be extremely, extremely harmful if used in the wrong way. Ladies and gentlemen, the probability that the tools you developed are used in the wrong way is extremely high and nearing one. The model outcomes of your device models are, for the average politicians, an often used and very sharp weapon. Every political party and every minister wants to have positive results from your doorrekening and from your analysis. So he can say in the public domain, you see, I'm the best. And that's not because I say I'm the best. No, that's because there is this independent policy agency which has independent scientists, hundreds of them, and at the end of the day, my policies are the best. That's got two big advantages. At the one hand, it's almost impossible for your political opponent to criticize you. You try if you're a politician and you have on television 20 or 30 seconds speaking times. To first, or two minutes in the debate in the Dutch parliament, you first try to explain why the model which is being applied is wrong. <laughs> well, you will fail because of complexity. I need 20 minutes for this speech and I would like to have two hours. And by the way, you run the risk of being labeled as a science denier. And that's really harmful for your policy career as well. On the other side, <clears throat> if you have these great policy outcomes, you've got great publicity. The media take the outcomes of the models without any caveats. They are the absolute truth. So the newspaper Trouw had as its lead, the program of the Socialist Party is the best for nature and biodiversity. No ifs, no buts, no caveats. And the more conservative newspaper, The Telegraaf, wrote the VVD is the champion in employment, champions of making jobs. After having gone through the policies. And by the way, your average voter only reads that, doesn't even read the article, let alone your paper, I'm sorry to tell you. So who's against jobs and who's against nature? So the effect of these newspaper headlines is really large. So politicians are not aiming to improve the actual outcomes. They're aiming to improve the outcomes in your models. And the effect is quite large. In election time, election manifestos and programs are used are written using the models of the planning agency and your environmental agency. The government and the political parties choose measures on the basis of policy papers you've written, Kansrijk Beleid, they are called in the Netherlands, and they know exactly which policy gets the best outcomes. So the policy, the models you make, are no longer used as tools, useful tools to assess the effects of policy choices, but they are, they form the policy themselves. 
And that's not what these tools are used for, and you know it, as you made those tools. And I do as well, because I used to make them. Because, as George Box stated, all models are wrong, some are useful. And you'll, you know that, especially in uh, social sciences, models are just a description of reality, and sometimes a fairly bad one but they cannot be come in the place of real decisions. In real decisions, you have to take the reality and the whole reality. And that's never in, totally captured in the model. If you let the model decide your policy, that will lead to problems in reality. Let me illustrate this. Um, in, um, let me illustrate this. Um, uh, um, taking one of the headlines which I just mentioned, in which the Conservative Liberal Party, VVD, was actually the champions in creating jobs. The, cha the VVD got this title because in its election program it took a set of fiscal policies. Um, for instance, it raised the income-dependent combination um, uh, tax break. And that's so... <laughs> It would take me five minutes to explain what it is, but it's, it's a tax break which leads to the fact that single income households actually have the highest average and marginal tax rate in the Netherlands and double income households have a low marginal tax rate. Now, if you know that, then you know if you have a single income and if you have a high marginal and average tax rate, you get poverty. And that's what you have in the Netherlands, a single income household is poverty. But because poverty is not one of the metrics in which you measure, you'll see that a single income household with income X pays two, three, and sometimes eight times as much tax as a double income household with the same income divided by two and then multiplied by two because two people working. But it's a great incentive in the models. So if you have these incentives in the models, more people will work. The problem is, there are those people who can't work. There are those people who have a sick partner or a partner who has got no income and cannot find a job. That does not enter the policy choice because it's not part of the metric on which you measure. So when you create jobs, you actually create um, uh, labor um, supply in the models. And because you have a general equilibrium model, the labor supply in the long term will lead to jobs. But that's something differ different from solving your actual problems in society. This policy choice has got real consequences. Because what I told you, some people cannot work. And if they cannot work, they fall into dire poverty. And that poverty is worse than in other countries. And that's because of the incentives in our tax policies, which are being driven by the models. But it goes further. This particular policy has got effect on housing policies. Because some people cannot even start living together because they'll lose their income. If you look at people who are handicapped young, they cannot no longer live together because they use, lose all their income. Um, and by the way, I really doubt whether it will really lead to policy effects because the incentives are so high. And if you, ch if you um, wonder that yourself, look at the latest publications of the um, Central Plan Bureau, the planning agency. Four years ago, they said raising the minimum wage will destroy jobs. Four years later, they said raising the minimum wage will no longer destroy jobs. And mind you, all the programs were adjusted. And I can give you a lot of these kind of examples in which the actual policy aim is to get as high marks as possible inside the models of your agencies for the purchasing power, for the macroeconomic effects. And all other effects which are not being measured are not taken into the considerations. From the principles of rightness just to the very negative effects of those households which are not standard in the models, and there are quite a lot of them. I can give you more examples. I can give you the examples of a proposed reform that would actually make sure that someone who has had an accident on work 
and has an earning capacity of only 1,000 euros a year, had to work according to this policy at least for 500 euros a year, and otherwise his um, benefit would be cut by half. When I tell you this, you say that's stupid. If someone has an earning capacity of 1,000 euros a year, you know that such a person is severely handicapped. That means working one and a half hour a week against minimum wage. Yeah, then you're severely, then you've got two hours a week. Then you've got severe problems. Yet it was proposed because it came out of one of these policy papers. And even though I warned during cabinet formation, look what that does in reality. You will have paraplegics being forced to go to work because, yes, they can answer the phone for two hours a week. But what, is, what are you doing? By the way, I didn't win the argument during the cabinet formation in 2017. I won it once some um, policy analyst in the Ministry of Social Affairs in 2018 finally figured out what sort of effect it would have. Um, it, this kind of policy choices, by the way, has led the Netherlands to marginal tax rates of about 80% on single income households between minimum wage and um, one and a half time average wage. Um, so you get unscrutable and unjust outcomes. Let's go to this policy agency, climate policy. If you look at climate, climate policy, and if you, were going, if you were to go back to 2012, to the election programs, which were all analyzed by your agency, you know what really was the right thing to do? Biomass. Biomass was the great thing. So, to co-fire a coal plant station with biomass. And because that was really the thing to do in your models to actually get to get CO2 reduction and to start, stop global heating, because yeah, we had a 10% um, coal fire in the SGP, that's the Conservative Christian Party, 20% for the VVD, CDA, and SP, which are the Conservative Liberals, Christian Democrats, and SP, and those agents and those parties which are really green, Christian Union, uh, Socialist Party, PVDA, D66, the sort of the Liberals and Green Left Party, they had 30%. And this led to billions of subsidies for biomass. And from by now we know there are very good reasons to think that we did not destroy only millions of trees, but also billions of subsidies. Because they did not lead, later policy analysis showed us, to great um, climate effects which we had expected. So we're now trying to get rid of them. Does that change? Well, in the last round of your models, carbon capture storage is the great thing. That really gives you the most CO2 reduction for your euro. And that means that you actually put, you take empty gas fields and you fill them with um, uh, carbon dioxide. So what did, what did the election manifestos say? Use that at a grand scale. Read the election manifestos of Green Left, D66, Christian Union, and the Social Democratic Party. And they got their reward. In newspaper trouw, Green Left was actually being championed as the climate champion. And all the other parties that are using carbon storage on a grand scale got great marks in the media. All of us know that there are great doubts whether you want to use carbon storage on such a scale. Because you know, a lot of foreign investors will get very rich. It will not really solve the climate problem in the world. You had to think about how to cut emissions. And by the way, Shell and Exxon and Mobile, which are not particularly the friends of the left-wing parties, will also get quite rich out of this. But it was great in the model outcomes and it then uh, came a real policy. What you really want is a fundamental discussion of the pros and cons of such measures. And in the ideal world, not just here, but also in our parliaments. But because it's not the reduction of CO2 in the real world, which is important, but in the models, 
this is the policy you get. This is how you evaluate cabinet policy, and this is how, policy, how political parties write their ele election manifestos, and this is how journalists write their articles and their headlines. And especially with the present Prime Minister, who really, um, yeah, how to say this kindly, um, is um, obsessed by, his, by the image in the media of his policy. And by the way, he's not alone in that, to be quite frank. You get the policy which is actually the outcome of your models. So if you want to be the boss of this country, you've got to be here. You have to write the models. Because the models actually determine the cadre in which you actually discuss policy. The political fight is no longer on who has the, has the best policy. We all have 30 seconds to explain it. But only who has the best outcomes of the models. And who puts himself outside of the model with severe critique on carbon storage or in 2012 on biomass puts himself outside of the set order. And it's very difficult to change policy. And that's why we got masses of biomass. And because it was good in the models and um, everyone denied um, at that point in time the uh, consequences also for other policy areas air quality, air pollution, which were the side effects. Change the model and the policy changes. I just also said it on the minimum wage, but you can change something else. And that's the definition. If you go to the Kyoto Protocol, you will find that um, air traffic, and by the way, also shipping, are excluded. By the way, if you really care about air pollution and about climate policy, you would need to do something against air traffic and you really want to change the um, way um, large ships are being fired with absolute disastrous um, uh, oil products. Yeah? But it's not happening because it's not happening at that speed simply because it's not encapsulated in models or in the measurement because it's not in that protocol. So it's here where it's interesting, if you want to change the policy, and if you're a lobbyist, you make sure your sector is not in the models or is in the models when you get the subsidies. Then, obviously, um, you can also change the unit of measurement to change the policy outcome. And that's what the strange thing uh, is in your agency. The, your agency calculates the energy and climate measures in a very special way. If I look at how you, yeah, you know my favorite car. If you look at the fiscal measures of these electric cars, and by the way, people call me anti-electric car, anti cars. I'm not against electric cars. I'm against the subsidies, the two large subsidies on electric cars. It's great. Uh, this one goes probably from zero to 100 kilometers in three seconds, and you can do great things with it. So don't worry about it. I don't have one, by the way, in case you wonder. But if you look at the electric cars, they were hugely oversubsidized. And the, um, on the minister, Wiebes at some point said, well, we actually paid six billion euros and we had zero effect on climate. He also included diesel, by the way, because it was also a diesel tax break. But the electrical car policy was that. And by the way, but why did we get there? How did you measure it? Well, if you look at the official measurements, the costs from 2024 onwards are negative of electrical cars. That's, there are no longer costs, there are benefits. That's what Refnext, it's a commercial consultancy agency whose model you use for actually evaluating electric car policy. It's something you should never have done. You should be in charge of your own models. They should be public models. They should be open. It's a closed model. It's an agency which also uses them for electric car manufacturers. How big do you want to have the conflict of interest to be? I mean, it's obvious. Stop it. But there is something else there. Something else there.
It's the use of the concept of national cost. It's taken me quite a few questions in Parliament to find out what national cost is. National cost give a view of the cost to the Dutch society as a whole, um, no matter who bears those costs, is actually stated in one of your report. Subsidies and taxes in the Netherlands are not seen as part of national cost because they are transfers within the Netherlands. But if we would take subsidies in our models, it, you would understand why the Tesla, which cost billions in subsidies, in this case tax breaks, did actually so little. Because if you give a tax break and you raise someone else's cost, then you let someone else pay those billions. But in your model of national cost, it is zero cost because you shift the cost. But it wasn't zero cost for those people who had a very small old car because their taxes were raised to actually subsidize those measures. You actually write a disclaimer on this. But politicians, journalists and policymakers do not really read the small print, I can tell you. And a nice example of someone who was not able to read the small print is Ed Nijbels. Now Ed Nijbels is not just someone. He is being labeled in some Dutch newspapers as being the Pope of climate policy. He was actually the head of the climate policy tables. And he actually traveled up and down the country. And when he was asked, well, why is this climate policy? Is it so expensive? He would say it's only three to four billion euros a year. For the foreign experts, this is 0.4% of GDP. And that's relatively large. Of course, he would say it's a it's a large amount, but it's less than we actually spend every year on smoking. And he actually put this nice set of um, fruits on the, uh, on the screen. The cost of, the, um, of healthcare are the size of a melon. And if you look at the cost of climate policy, it's a small blackberry. And it's actually the raspberry, which are the cost of smoking. And he would go on, if it would be, um, if, it would, if it would be unaffordable, that's just a myth. The climate policy, ladies and gentlemen, is highly affordable, he would say. All of you now know that Mr. Naples used your models in totally the wrong way. National cost was confused with public expenditure. And those two things are absolutely unrelated. I will give you an advantage. That melon over there, that is the cost of healthcare. But that shouldn't be the cost of healthcare. It's smaller than the raspberry. Because I start with making you pay, all of you, your healthcare cost, both um, on um, having your nominal monthly fee and via your um, uh, tax. Uh, and then I spend it. The difference, because from our general government policy we pay for the under 18th, is a few billion. If I were to calculate healthcare costs in this way, it would be three to four billion, not a hundred billion a year it is in the present budget. And it would actually be smaller than a climate policy. So please stop doing this. And the same I could do with social security, it would shrink to the size of a raspberry. So there are limitations to the usefulness of this system. It gives a really, it gives really no insight in the real cost for society. Um, if we were to do this to social policy, we would get exactly the same. You pay, um, well, uh, in the Netherlands, it's mainly the employer that plays the payroll taxes to pay for the unemployment and the um, uh, the insurance if you become disabled, and that would shrink as well. So when Mr. Naples said, it's important that I tell you what the facts are, I now tell him that it's important to tell you what the facts are. This is no way you want to measure it and you want to stop using these measurements. So you see that the presentation of Mr. Naples, who should have known, has used the models in the wrong way and has used the metric in the wrong way. And that's worrying because of his function. 
but this shaped the climate policy, this particular way of using it. And there are more problems. I haven't written them down, but let me give you one or two. Model uncertainty is something we rarely discuss, rarely do. But in the beginning of the corona crisis, the model of, of the, the agency that wrote it, our IVM in the Netherlands, had that, the big problem in the Netherlands is that we have a really low number of ICU units. So we knew that would be a constraint. And if there's no ICU units, someone will die. And at the beginning of the crisis, the modelers had the assumption, the model assumption, that you would be in ICU for nine days. Three weeks later, they figured out it was 23 days. So you then need 130% more ICU units. Please communicate to the rest of the world that this is the kind of model uncertainty we're working with. And if you look at the present pension reform, then you have the Dutch National Bank saying you it should really work in our models. We got scenario sets, 60,000 observations, yeah, 60,000 obser 600,000 observations, sorry, 600,000 observations on inflation, 10,000 of sets of scenarios running for 60 years. You know what the highest inflation point in those models is, and these models were calibrated last year? 5.6%. Do not mistake large models <laughs> for reality. The inflation in the Netherlands for our foreign observers is now to the tune of 14%, and some measurements will tell you 17%. And you know this model uncertainty. And it's one of those examples. Now, obviously, I could whinge on. But the real thing is, is can we change something? Can we change something? How do we get the proper use of models and model outcomes so we get a real policy debate? What is the useful policy? How do we not try to improve the outcome in the model world? How do we try to improve the outcome in the real world? And obviously, the, use, the usual thing is that we point at each other. You point at us, we point at you. But let me say, if you use a tool in the wrong way, then uh, if the tool is being used in the wrong way, then you'll say politicians have to change their behavior. And maybe you really think so. Maybe you really think you're only making models and that you've got bear no responsibility for the awful use of models by politicians. Because after all, it's those bloody politicians who take their cat, put it in the microwave, and then blame someone else. And by the way, you cannot be responsible. Well, let me tell you, you are responsible. If you look at the legal outcome in the Netherlands, then actually it does say in the Dutch Civil Code that you are obliged to inform the user about the risk of the wrong use of the models. And you have to take into account, yes, the possible um, uninformedness of the person who's actually using it, politicians in this way. Sometimes, if the risk is not too large, you can actually put some small print. Sometimes you need a screaming warning, screaming. And in all other tools which are being used, this is being applied in the Netherlands. Yeah? Has any one of you used, used any medicines over the last few weeks? Ever tried to read what the possible side effects are? If you've ever read the list, you'll never use the medicine. Yeah? Any one of you has tried to enter into a financial contract? You have to sign disclaimers, waivers, anything. Not for models. And let me tell you, if you look at Article, si uh, article um, if you look at Book Six, Article One Eight Six of the Civil Code, you have this obligation. And if you look at the Dutch High Court in October 1999, in the case of Kohlhaas versus Rockwool, you see that this responsibility runs not just for the person who gets your model, but anyone who uses your model they should be informed of the risks. And there are no reasons that you, as a manufacturer, should be excluded of this general legal obligation. 
you are responsible for the right use of your models. That means that sometimes you'll have to devise something like this. Yeah? You'll have to put that loud and clear on it, even if you know that most people realize how to use a chainsaw. It has to be in order. Um, and to give you the example of what you wrote, national costs are the cost of Dutch society as a whole. National costs should be not be seen as how the costs are actually divided over the parties in society. Any normal reader will understand this as follows. The national cost is 4 billion euros, and I and the few poor ones in my specific group have to pay the 4 billions, and the happy few do not have to pay those 4 billions. But the total cost which is being divided is 4 billion. No one understands this to mean that someone pays in the example of the um, healthcare policy, 100 billion and 96 billion is being spent. So this disclaimer does not pass the test. It also means that when the risks are large, your warning has to be large. Small prints are not enough. Mm, shall we take an example? I don't have it here, but you know it by heart. A map by the minister on nitrogen policy. It colored, it colored the whole of the Netherlands. Some parts were colored in red. If it were colored in red, the intended policy of, I'm telling this for the foreign guests, the intended policy of our government was that nitrogen emissions had to be cut by 95% by anyone who was living in that area. It's the same as a death announcement of your farmer. If you live in that area, there is no way you can reduce your emissions by 95%. But, um, but underneath, there were all kinds of assumptions about ammonia from the stables, from the field, and that led to a, uh, a total different map than if you had actually taken the sources of the emission. Well, you didn't take the sources, we take the how it actually, um, the, the neerslag, the position. You can read it. I mean, if you read the papers, it was actually written there, but it should have been on the map, loud and clear. The indicative reduction as on this map are the result of the policy choices of the ministry. Other policy choices would have led to a different policy set. And for those of you who don't realize what happened, those farmers who were living in the red areas, their banking arrangements were blocked the next day. Yeah? So the wrong, the not warning, the use of models for a policy which we should discuss about, don't get me wrong, had real effects and basically all destroyed the lives because those those people immediately were not able to do anything in their farm. And by the way, I should warn you, from a legal point of view, that you also have an active duty if you make models, even if no one asks you. So, um, if you make a microwave oven and you hadn't thought of warning someone to put the cat in the microwave is not a good idea, then if you see that someone puts the cat in the microwave, still means that you have to warn at that particular moment and say, don't do it. And I'll give you the example when warnings should have applied. In 2022, the province of Drenthe actually decided not to give a permit for the musical um, Pauper Paradise. The reason is that that particular musical was six kilometers from a nature, 20, 000, nature 2000 area. And according to the area's calculations, the fact that car people would come by car to actually look at it, would actually, in the aggregate, lead to a temporary increase in the deposition of nitrogen on that nature area to the tune of about 0 0.01 mole per hectare per year. But that's not statistically significant. Actually, how statistical significant is a factor 100 lower than Germany uses it. 
And there was a TNO model which says this is totally ridiculous if you use that as the barrier. And you know, if in a model, the model outcome is that there is an increase of 0.01 more per hectare per year, you probably have an equal chance of increase to a decrease because that's how large the standard deviation is on that particular estimate. That means that you could have thrown with a dice to decide whether to give a um, permit or not. That would probably be, would have been a fairer way of doing it. It was on national television. Did we have any scientists that scream out, hang on, this is not the way you should use our models. It's not meant that if thousands of people want to have a really great event, that you should cancel it. It's got no real meaningful reduction to harm to the environment to it. It just didn't happen. But it would have been the obligation of the makers of these models to say this out light and clear. And the price we're paying for not doing so is not just that all these volunteers saw their work cancelled. So that's the first price. It's unexplicable to the people, even the people who don't understand and the models understood that this was the wrong way of applying that. But it leads to distrust in your institution, distrust in science, and thus distrust to policy in general. If we're not open about the limitation of the model outcomes, and people discover these limitations out of their own account, they will feel misled. They will no longer believe me, they will no longer believe you. And that would be the end of a really useful tool which had a lot to offer for Dutch policymaking. Thank you very much.